Ladies and gentlemen, and others, <laughs> to Conversations While Dining Alone, a series of monologues to make you think, to make you laugh, to cry, and hopefully to piss you off. <laughs> and uh, now, would you help me welcome the cast to the stage? You ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, now I'm going to start this little charade off by doing the first monologue since I'm already here front and center. My name is Dell. Unfortunately, that's my first name, not my last. Michael Dell. And the first one I'm going to be doing is that damned blouse. I don't even know why I did it. Stuck the damn blouse in my handbag without paying for it. I mean, I had money and a wallet full of credit cards. It was, it was an impulse that frightened me enough to uh, pee myself. The ladies' room, I asked the sales lady when she turned back to me, had she noticed the missing blouse? Would she contact the manager or worse, the police? In the dressing area to your right, the haughty woman in the basic black dress answered. A smile stretching across her face like a wide red rubber band. Oh God, why had I taken that damn blouse? I chastised myself as I hurried to the dressing area. I didn't even need a fucking blouse. Inside the ladies' room, I pulled the blouse from my handbag. God, it was a hideous color. Cut totally wrong for my neck. I'd look like crap in this. So I crammed the offensive piece of material deep into the wastebasket carefully covering it with an assortment of used Kleenex and tampon tubes. And I hurried into the stall. I pulled down my pantyhose, yanked down a wad of toilet paper, and blotted the pee that had run down my leg. I sat there in the metal confines of the stall and wondered about my life and how it had come to this. What would I tell my therapist if I had the courage to tell her? Why did I continue seeing a therapist paying all that money if I couldn't be honest? And why was I embarrassed by the truth? I thought back to the, the moment that the idea flashed across my mind to steal the blouse. God, the rush of adrenaline, the thrill of it. God, I thought to myself, sitting there in the quiet of the ladies' room at Neiman Marcus, God, it was better than sex. At least the sex I'd had lately. <laughs> but without the complications of another individual. I brightened, stood, and hurried out of the stall. I had to get back to shopping. I knew there was something I needed desperately. A bigger purse. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Beryl, and my piece is called Pricked. <clears throat> you know, ladies, when I woke up this morning, everything hurt. Nothing new, just the same hurts as always. I was glad. It's the new hurts that worry me, panic me. I felt better after a nice hot shower to get the kinks out. I peeked out the window to see what the weather was like. It was nasty. I was glad I didn't have any medical appointments. I like dread getting pricked by the young doctor. Funny that word, prick. I hadn't heard the word till my, till my grandson called his friend one. You prick, he yelled. Why'd you call him that, I asked. Because, Nana, he's a dick. Well, that's when I made the connection. I'd heard the word dick before and the cock word but penis was the only word I'd ever heard in connection with the male genitalia. The nuns saying penis in biology class was always good for a snicker or two. The joke was that she wanted us girls to know what a penis was so we could avoid it if we were ever confronted with one. <laughs> oh, my grandson had other names for it, like a Woody and Johnson. 
I knew someone called Woody once, and he definitely was a Johnson. <laughs> but it's been years since I was confronted with one. I wonder as I look around the table here, how many of you ladies ever think about a prick? I do. Often. <laughs> I'm L, and this piece is called Validation. Oh, I'm fine. I'm, yeah, I'm not fine. We argued again. I don't even know what set him off this time. It's always some trivial matter that can be settled by a common sense approach. You know, I think that's what bothers me the most. The fact that he doesn't see that everything has a logical solution. And our hostilities rob me of my energy, and it's energy that I need to take care of the house and the kids. I mean, I was actually surprised when I found myself wishing he was dead. And then I was ashamed for thinking such a horrible thing, but God, his death would really simplify my life. But then how would I take care of the house and the kids? If I were financially independent, I would have left years ago. From the moment I saw him naked on our wedding night, our marriage has been a huge disappointment. <laughs> so I did what I always do. I packed up the kids and I went to Starbucks. I was standing there wondering how I would survive without him and I caught my reflection in the mirror over the counter. And I thought, you know, if I maybe put on a little more makeup, curled my hair, dropped a few pounds, I could be hot. And then I looked around. There were men passing time on their cell phones and their laptops, and not one of them even looked at me. And it hurt because I really needed that validation. I was leaving, and a really handsome gentleman held the door open for me. It was such a simple gesture, but at that moment, it meant the world to me. May I ask you a question, I said. He looked a little startled, but said, uh, sure. I'm embarrassed to ask, but this morning I'm, I'm a desperate woman with a fragile ego, so I'm hoping you'll be kind, but honest. Go ahead, he said. Would you, <clears throat> would you pay good money to sleep with me? <laughs> I'm Barbara, and I'm going to do They Want Me. You want to know how I got to be here? in this lovely, safe place. Well, that morning I reached down and lifted the smelly garbage bag from its container and lugged it to the curb and deposited it into the trash. And then I gazed about the neighborhood and nothing exceptional was going on. So I walked back to the kitchen and stood staring down at the bare blue garbage can. I would have to go under the sink to get the garbage bags. So I opened the doors. Uh, the roll of garbage bags was under there somewhere, somewhere along with the, the Drano and the hundred other chemicals that I had long ago forgotten purchasing or, 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 or what they were supposed to be used for. I do remember buying them at the time, hoping that they would make my life easier. Now I just obsessed on the proper way to dispose of them. I, I sat down at the table, staring at the colorful containers crowded together under the sink. Such lovely labels for lethal substances, I thought. <laughs> A large Dead roach lay belly up, partially decomposed, its spindly legs pointing heavenward. And for a moment, I felt sorry for the poor creature. 
and I wondered what chemical it had last dined out on. Drano, I surmised, seeing the skull and crossbones on the can. And then I uh, wondered how long it took a chemical to kill something, what it tasted like, and was it painful. I, I was lonely there in my tiny kitchen. And I started fantasizing about all the men I had come in contact with. <laughs> there was the slightly balding TV salesman who had accidentally rubbed my arm when selling me a TV. Oh, and the Mexican butcher with a tattoo of Our Lady of Guadalupe on his chest. Oh, and the tall, attentive waiter at my favorite restaurant. <laughs> and then there was the, the postman who smiled at me with crooked teeth. Every man I came in contact with who showed me the least morsel of attention, I immediately fell in love with. Never for a moment did I consider that they were just doing their jobs, providing me with a service. To me, they were secretly wanting me, subdued and silenced by my beauty, and unable to tell me how much they desired me. I yanked the garbage bag from the roll and for the first time read the warning label on the container. Keep out of the reach of children. Danger of suffocation. And I wondered what it would feel like to suffocate. I had never been a good swimmer, couldn't hold my breath for very long. So I, I pulled the bag down over my head and breathe in the smell of plastic. It seemed so right. My name is Diana, and this is a leg of her own. It's been 10 years, but I remember every detail. I'd run out of hiding places. And what was my husband doing anyway, looking in the clothes dryer? I mean, he'd never washed a load of clothes in his entire 30-year marriage. I don't know what irked me more, the fact that he found it or the fact that he didn't have faith in me, saying, you can't be trusted. Well, I, I lied, of course. I told him I'd put it in there before. But we both knew that the maid had washed a dozen load of clothes since I took his mandatory oath. So he was snooping around, looking for it. You know, I didn't snoop around when he swore that he'd stop smoking. I mean, I even cut him some slack when I, I smelled it on his clothes. That lame story about a friend smoking in the car. <laughs> but standing there, looking into that empty dryer, I, I began to shake with self-loathing. I was the wife of an important man. I had two beautiful children, a lovely home in a gated community. I was beloved by all for my charity work. I tried to justify it by saying that other mothers in my circle did it. Well, they introduced me to it. I was curious at first, and then it took over what had been my once full days. 
Well, I knew all the words. Stoner, doper, crackhead, junkie, addict. And the word I used when I started out, recreational. But standing there, I started to sweat and my hands began to tremble. And I said, how the hell did this ever happen to me? I'm in the fucking junior leg. Hi, I'm Jeanette, and this piece is called Scream. I'm glad you and your husband have a good sex life. Me? I wanted to scream during sex for the longest. Not just lie there all frozen and stiff, afraid to move. I crave variety. But the missionary position is the only position our lovemaking ever takes. I, I try to understand why he feels that way. We are Catholic. <laughs> anyway, last night I did it. Revealed how I really feel during sex. I had bought a book with pictures of partners in different positions. I locked the bathroom door and opened the book. There are so many positions. <laughs> I really, really liked the Dale Evans, the queen of the cowboys position, where the woman straddles the man. I'm tired of being buried under him. He's gained so much weight since we got married. I feel suffocated, strangled almost. Not a partner like the book suggests. The book also says <clears throat> part of the fun of sex is the surprise of it, the unexpected to keep it interesting. Well, girl, you know I was shocked. I never <laughs> thought of it as fun or entertaining. Just an obligation, work. <laughs> well, last night, I decided to do as the book suggests climb on top, and ride off into the sunset. I know the signs when he expects sex. I threw off the covers. We are always covered. <laughs> Climbed on top, dug in my heels, and sang happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. My. Well, then it happened, just like I told you what happened on our wedding night. He went limp, rolled over, muttered something under his breath that sounded surprisingly like whore, and pretended to sleep. I yanked those covers back up and wondered if I could return the damn book. Sex for dummies. <laughs> I'm John. This section is called Men Only. And this piece is called Their Crap, His Stuff. I know just what you mean about your space. I felt safe in the garage. The garage was my domain. The rest of the family had long since stopped parking their cars there in my space and settled on the driveway or at the curb out by the street. I took a sip of my morning coffee and looked around. Too damn much of their crap occupied my territory. The wife kept promising a garage sale but she was always too busy to get it together. 
Some of the crap was okay, but the boxes, and boxes, and boxes, labeled children's things, was way too much of their crap. The kids were all gone to college, or just gone. I took, took a look around, and then I realized that what they needed to do was honor my space. Heaven knows, I didn't ask for much. There was nothing in the house for me to relate to. It was all theirs. I didn't like sleeping under floral sheets or bathing surrounded by bottles and jugs of beauty supplies or drying off with fluffy pink towels with lace trim. But I did it for years without complaining. All I ever asked was my own tiny oasis in the garage. Some place I could be myself. Some place that didn't smell of deodorant and hairspray and potpourri. <laughs> Some place that smelled of oil and grease and lawn fertilizer. <laughs> Some place I could track mud into without removing my boots. Some place I could sweat. She poked her head in the door while I was oiling the lawnmower. Honey, she called in that sweet, I need you voice I love. This should make you happy. What is it, I answered, my hopes up. There's a leak under the sink in the kitchen. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> I'm Lance Barnett performing Trash Out. No, no, no. I didn't buy the damn thing. It was a damn good deal. But I didn't act on my instincts. So now, I'm obsessing over it, needing it berating myself for not buying the damn thing. I made myself sick. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea over it. God, it was perfect. I could have used it. and It would have been an investment. I could have gotten double what I paid for it. What a fool I was to let that opportunity slip right through my fingers. It'll never happen again. But you know what? It's not my fault. It's hers, the bitch. When I went back, gone, gone forever. When she walked into the laundry room with a basket of my dirty clothes, I told her, it's your fault. You were negative about my having one and I let your negativity color my decision. Are you still obsessing over that? She asks, stuffing the laundry into the washing machine. Why didn't you buy the damn thing? It probably didn't work anyway. Like all the other black and white TVs cluttering up the garage. You gotta stop going to those garage sales. That's what's ruining our marriage. Shit! <laughs> <laughs> My name is Burton, and this piece is an excuse. Dude, you are not going to believe what happened next. I watched as my friend's eyes glazed over. You know, it never failed. Every time I had something important to say, some bit of good news or a personal tragedy, or what I considered a personal tragedy, Halfway through the telling, my friend's attention would begin to waver. Am I that boring? Didn't I give them my undivided attention when listening to their illnesses or their husband-wife problems? Didn't I give them my undivided attention in other ways too? I mean, honestly, 
What's the difference between a failed marriage and a failed toilet? <laughs> Wasn't I just as concerned about both? I know they're bored with me, but I also know I am not a boring person. Their rise above it attitude, it's a problem for me because I am a doer, a person who accomplishes things. And they, the rise above it people, they never do anything with their lives. Oh, I listen. I listen to all of the grand things, the, the things they intend to accomplish, the books they intend to write. But nothing ever comes of them. Why the pretense? I don't know. I've always been real, honest. Maybe, maybe I'm an embarrassment to them because I'm a doer, something they only pretend to be. It's like the sign over the, my desk at work. The person who wants to do something finds a way. The other kind? finds an excuse. Hi, I'm David. This is called Big Mac Attack. What? <laughs> no, no. I didn't have breakfast at the Four Seasons. I had another plastic breakfast at Plastic McDonald's that I paid for with plastic. I watched as the street people dribbled in, contrite with their used McCoffee cups that they dug out of the trash cans with their dirty hands, waiting in line for their free cup of morning coffee. The men and the women, occasional women, whom I call the great unwashed, took their free cups of coffee to the children's play area outside where they could smoke and share stories of nightly ordeals with fellow unwashed. It was the same group of sordid individuals arriving shortly after dawn, emerging from clandestine places where they bedded down for the night, probably the front door of my office building where they peed all night freely. I'd seen them not far from there, on the street corners, with crude signs, pleading their case in bad grammar and misspelled words, begging for any change will help while smoking cigarettes that cost a Big Mac a pack. <laughs> I thought about myself. What separated me from them? I felt displaced when I had a very nice place. I envied their freedom when I supposedly had freedom. I begrudged their friendships when I had lots of friends. I especially envied their acceptance of each other, warts and all. I thought about all the times that I didn't want to bathe, didn't want to shave, when my job, my social status, my, my girlfriend, they demanded it. I thought about all the possessions I'd owned that I'd purchased and loved and then fell out of love with. They were there, surrounding me. I'd given them away to some charity and they would mysteriously reappear in different forms, different shapes, different needs, different pleasures. I, I was suffocating in needs that I didn't even need. <laughs> Finally, I, I ripped a piece of cardboard off a, a box containing my latest need, took a marker and scrolled, please help, anything will do. The name of this piece is Pee in the Sink. <laughs> Pee in the Sink. It'll save your marriage. And cut down on the utilities at the same time. If it didn't do much for yours. Well, hell, I figured it out too damn late. If he'd peed in that sink a year earlier, I'd still be married to that hard-ass woman. <laughs> now, he pees in the sink just out of spite. If every house had a urinal, it would cut down the divorce rate by half. True. So, uh, which sink do you pee in? Both. But my favorite's the kitchen. Really? Isn't that awkward? I mean, my kitchen sink's kind of well, 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 I don't, I don't actually pee in the sink. I pee in a cup. Ah, 
That way you can pee and make dinner at the same time. Then I dump the cup of pee in the kitchen sink. Ooh, that's a pleasant image. And I don't just pee in any old cup. Well, what cup do you pee in? My favorite. A pretty pink one with, with I, I love, love mama, mama written on it. <laughs> My name is Raphael. This segment is called Personals, and I'll be performing Lifers. Uh, okay, well, m maybe you can help me with this, because every time I come, I just want to go. You know, I, I, it's always the same for me. I mean, how do those people do it, you know, those lifers? I mean, that's what I'm thinking to myself as I'm sneaking out of her apartment quickly and quietly. I was trying to think about the last time I had a, a, a real relationship and how long it lasted. I mean, I'm thinking of this as I'm running down the stairs, two at a time, like my life depended on it. Really concerned that someone's going to see me coming out of that, out of her apartment. I mean, now don't get me wrong, I mean, she was good enough for last night when I was drunk and really horny, but <laughs> God forbid someone would know that I was that desperate. A week. Seven days. That's my longest relationship. That's pretty sad. Now I'm sitting in my car alone, and the sun is coming up, and I'm hating myself again. And I'm hating myself because I realize the kind of despicable actions that I'm capable of. I mean, I'm a user, and I don't want to be a user. And I swear that every time I fuck and I run, I, I'm not going to get drawn into that seduction again. And I give myself all the right reasons, and I always wear a condom. But the thoughts still plague me. And I cringe at that word, plague. So, alone in my car, and the sun's coming up. I look at my watch and I realize I've got enough time to go home and take a shower and get ready for work. And I need a shower. I need a shower desperately. This piece is called The Actress. You think you know her? Oh, you don't know her. We know her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we wondered why our friend needed enemies. She was an excellent actress. Yes, but every time she took on a new role, there was always someone in the cast who hindered her progress. Someone who plotted against her. Or someone she simply couldn't stand. She was excellent at everything she put her talents yes, to. Yes, but why did she need enemies? Real or imagined. And why did she have to belittle others? is a mystery to me. Oh, I think it gave her a false sense of superiority. We ourselves were never subjected to her mistreatment. Oh, yes, but remember, we witnessed them many a time. Well, we liked and respected her talents, so we put up with her outbursts. Her tardiness. Her deceptions when the truth would have worked just fine. Yeah. One day, we watched her mimicking and mocking an actress she had just been cast with. Yes, which made us wonder if our friendship was a fraud. Yeah, why did she keep coming back to us? She didn't need us. What did she need us for? She didn't need our friendship. Oh, well, she certainly didn't need our talent. She didn't need our minds. What she desperately needed from us was... An, an audience! audience. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Lindsay, and my piece is called Codependent. Okay, I made a mistake. I made a mistake telling him what our friends were saying about him. Something I had thought, but I couldn't bring myself to say. Well, ever since high school, we had had this crappy on-again, off-again relationship. Friends, lovers, friends, enemies, just friends. Well, our story changed daily. He's someone you 
love to hate one day and hate to love the next. I talked to you about this and your response was always the same. How can you tolerate the temper tantrums and the mood swings? A question I couldn't answer with a simple response. Well, it's complex. I mean, really, how could I answer a question I didn't have an answer for? My problem was becoming friendship dependent on him. I came to that realization one sleepless night while I was lying there worrying about him. And all this time I thought our relationship was reversed. Wasn't he the forgetful one, the negligent one, the accuser, the one who never failed to illuminate my faults and my shortcomings and my, my lack of physical appeal? Well, I had heard the term codependent, but I couldn't relate. I couldn't relate to that any more than he could relate to what I told him our friends were saying about him. That he was emotionally unstable. <laughs> My name is Jennifer, and this is called Her Dilemma. Why is it, girls, when you finally meet that special someone, after months of nothing, as soon as you get attached, there comes another special someone in your life? Isn't that men are more attracted to women who are attached? Is it more of a challenge? What? Anyway, now I have a dilemma. I'm having an affair with two wonderful men, but I don't know who to be with. Both are extremely attractive. Both treat me with respect, you know, send flowers. All that crap women are supposed to find adorable. Both are really good kissers. Number one has a better job. I mean, he makes a ton of money and loves to spend it on me. Number two is a waiter slash actor who models and if you can believe it, is straight and horny. <laughs> Number one drives a Porsche. Oh, I already said he makes a ton of money. So, ladies, what does number two have that number one doesn't? Well, to be honest, number two has a bigger penis. Well, I've heard that a Porsche is a penis substitute. <laughs> so I'm wondering, do I wanna drive one? Or do I want to use your imagination, ladies? <laughs> I'm Tom, and the name of this piece is Back from the Dead. Sure, a lot of people thought I was an asshole, but at least I was consistent. <laughs> Not like one of those vacillating bitch bastards whom you never knew where you stood with them. Hot and cold people, I call them. They were nice to me when I was successful. But when I was no longer a recognizable name that they could drop to enhance their own social stature, I became invisible. Like Dracula. No image in the mirror. I'd been compared to Dracula once, rising from the ashes during one of my career incarnations, back from the artistic dead. They only wanted me when they needed something. I was only visible when I was a useful entity. I waited for that special call, the one without the needy voice, the call to say, hello, or how are you? But invariably, the how are you's were followed by, oh, by the way, can you do this for me? I was always hopeful at the beginning of the conversation, but invariably disappointed. Now I dread to hear the telephone ring. 
I can't take another disappointment. I don't want to disappear again. I'm Paul. This section is called Dining Alone, and I'm going to do a piece called The Dining Dead. I watch this elderly couple walk into the cafe and choose a table by the window. I was sitting at my little table, sipping my morning coffee, minding my own business, and tried but was unable to ignore them. It was an intimate restaurant. They looked to be in their 70s. She was youthful and petite, and he was large, with the kind of leathery hide you sometimes see on retired people, well-to-do with too much time on their hands. I imagine them to have been a handsome couple. She opened her purse, pulled out a paperback, opened it to a dog-eared page, and began to read. He opened the newspaper and scanned the front page. When no sound came from the table, I began to wonder if they were mute or deaf. <laughs> but I've seen a table of deaf people, and they were animated and full of life. The waiter came, the man smiled and ordered. She frowned, barely looked up from her book, stabbed at the menu with her well-manicured finger, and returned to her reading. They've been married too long, I thought, and have run out of things to say. I've seen that with other couples, eating together without saying a word. The dining dead, I call them. He pointed to a place on the front page, a photograph of Lance Armstrong, who had just won his seventh Tour de France. She glared up, hmm, shrugged, and returned to her reading, irritated at the intrusion. She obviously had waded through 30 pages of dull as dirt exposition to get to the sexy part. He took a deep breath, undoubtedly wishing for something in the news, something that would bring her back to reality. I wonder if 9-11 would have gotten this woman's attention. <laughs> My name is Dan. My piece is The Two Nets. It took me years to perfect the tune-out. I like people too much. But in order to protect myself, I had to work on my indifference. I'd seen it for some time now. I don't know what to blame it on. It must be the times we live in. I've seen it mostly in the young. The way they walk into a room without even noticing anyone, with blinders on like my grandma would say. I'd witnessed the dining dead. People who ate in restaurants without communicating. Was this the walking dead? They reminded me of those zombie movies I liked as a kid. Dead eyes with pale, expressionless faces. I didn't understand it. Why would anyone do that? Miss the opportunity to communicate with another human being. I wondered as I sank deeper and deeper inside myself, shutting out the world around me, hiding my true feelings, how much longer it would take until I began to morph into one of the undead. I'm Rosalie, and I'm going to do the makeup table. Hey, any of you guys out there got a cigarette? And I'll tell you what happened to me yesterday. Okay, so I'm homeless. 
But that's no reason for that friggin' Mexican waitress to watch me like a hawk when I walked into the cafe. So I took my time looking at the menu. It reminded me of when I could order anything I wanted. I chose potato and egg because I figured it would hold me until I could hustle up the money for my next meal. While I waited, I took my makeup out of my leopard print bag and started to put on my morning face. I'd look in the mirror, but I looked like shit and it frightened me. <laughs> gone, gone was the damn homecoming queen and the, the sweetheart of, the sweetheart of the soldier who, he, he never came back from Vietnam. So I applied the makeup from memory. Hell, I'd done it for 65 years. I started with the foundation, hoping it would cover the age spots and the broken veins that ran amuck across my face. Too many years in bars, too many cigarettes and whiskey sours. The waitress brought my taco in a bad attitude. I didn't need food. Hell, I needed a new life. Anyway, I decided on Carl Pink lipstick. Not the bright red that Mexican waitress wore. Nothing, nothing says who are faster than bold cocksucking red. <laughs> I looked around the room. A group of men in matching uniforms laughing a little too loud caught my interest. <laughs> I like to play a little game. I'd search each face. You ladies, I bet you've done that too. Decide which one's the most handsome, which one I'd let screw me. And at another table, there was a, a couple sitting there, absorbed in the Austin American Statesman, like there was something newsworthy in it. <laughs> I never found that paper interesting, not even when I found one abandoned, tossed in the trash. The bitch of a waitress came and cleared the table and brought the check. I, I, I reached between my breasts and took out the tattered handkerchief, you know, the one my daughter gave me with the embroidered roses on it. And I untied the corners and counted out my money. Shit. I like saying the word because it's a metaphor for my life. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. I just had enough money for the taco and it embarrassed me. I put the money on the table, put my makeup back in the bag and stood up. I walked past the handsome man laughing with his friends past the couple with their noses in the paper, past the waitress with a condescending smile on her red cocksucking lips with as much <laughs> dignity as I could. I smiled as I walked out of the cafe and I wondered what that puta of a waitress would think when she saw the tip I left her, the tube of used up Carl pink lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, I'm Laurie, and this is called Her Job. Oh, you don't have to tell me. No matter how hard you try, you're always gonna have that one customer that just pisses you off. But yesterday, I had my hands full with the noon rush, but there was this one particular customer who was determined to carry on a conversation. How are you, he asked. Fine, I said, anxious to get on with my work. Do you like this cooler weather? Yes, I said, heading away from the table I had just cleaned and balancing a heavy tray of dirty dishes. I prefer the cooler weather myself. Good for you. The tray is growing heavier by the moment. Do you like waiting tables? Sometimes. Well, it was like this with him every noon when he came in. At first, I thought, you know, the guy's lonely. Then I suspected he had a crush on me. And after that, well, I didn't give a damn. <laughs> and sometimes I was, uh, well, I stopped being tip friendly. Was a little bit uh, rude with him a couple of times when he became unbearable. But I had other tables to please other customers to make happy. Service is my job. 
being gracious and kind, even when I don't feel like being gracious and kind. But I had a job to do, and I needed my job. You know, I told you I'm, I'm putting my son through college. Yes, I guess I did. Well, anyway, today this aggressive customer was impossible. So I set my dishes down on the table, took a deep breath, got a clean menu, and went to another customer with a look that probably said, I'm in a hurry, bitch. But I forced a smile. How are you? Oh, this woman yanked the menu out of my hand. Why do you even bother to ask, she said, when you don't really give a shit? <laughs> I, I, I plopped across from her and said, you know, you're right. I dusted a few crumbs from the table into her lap. Mm -hmm. I don't give a shit. <laughs> but I will spit in your food. <laughs> <laughs> then I took out my pad and pencil. Now. What do you have? <laughs> this piece is called Another Never. I was halfway through that novel you loaned me when I suddenly remembered a vow I had made to myself years ago. I would never be one of those lonely people eating alone, nose buried in a book. I looked across the table at the empty chair and thought, never say never. I glanced about the restaurant, feeling conspicuous and self-conscious. I closed the book and thought about the many nevers in my life, and there had been many. I'll never be like my mother. I'll never betray a friend. I'll never be poor. I'll never lie. I'll never steal. I'll never be afraid. I'll never kill anything. That last never chilled me. I looked down at my half-eaten plate of food and felt nauseous. Somebody could be sitting there with me and I wouldn't be eating alone. I was so young then. There was nobody to help me. I didn't know what else to do. I'd never do that today. Another never. Dinner time. I'm amazed that my husband and I have been together for as many years as we have. And, and sometimes uh, I wonder what I would do if anything happened to him. I don't have any skills. Oh, except keeping house and raising children. I suppose I could use those skills to sustain me, but I can't stand the thought of cooking and cleaning after someone else. And, Besides that, I've done enough of that already. So uh, sometimes I wonder what I could do to make a living. I couldn't ask the children for help. Oh, they're good kids, but they're busy with their own lives, establishing themselves in the world. And the thought of being dependent on them is just, mm. I happen to glance at the clock <laughs> and my heart sinks. I'm like, he, he'll be home soon, and I haven't even started dinner. He, he likes to eat as soon as he gets home. I hurry for the kitchen, but stop at the family table with all its 
scars and scratches, which for years I vigorously tried to pledge away, but which now serve as fond memories of coloring books and erector sets and science projects and after school homework. I hear the back door open and I catch my breath. And there he is, standing in the doorway, in his dirty work clothes, nodding at me. And suddenly, something within me stirs, and, and I see him in a different light. When was the last time I looked at him and saw him as I did years ago when we were young and so much in love? When was the last time I thought of him as my lover? And not just my husband, the father of my children, the provider. When was the last time I thanked him for all he does with something besides dinner on time? He gives me so much and expects so little in return. Well, the least I can do is have his dinner on time. I start with, for the refrigerator when he says something which I don't quite hear. What did you say, dear? Smiling, he says, baby, I feel like pizza. Let's eat out tonight. <laughs> and on that happy note, let's take a 10 minute intermission. All right, see you in 10 minutes. is called Relationships. This piece is Drawing Blood. Um, we actually divorced because I did something unspeakable. I hated the way I was feeling, angry and resentful, and I wondered why I allowed him to bring that out in me. I mean, our relationship had always been strained. I was outgoing and he was, well, you knew him. In your words, he was boring. But as the, as the sex became less and less frequent, I don't know, I just craved some sort of physical contact. But I was truly stunned the first time I hit him. I was also disappointed at his restraint. The more I thought about his complacency, his complete lack of response, the more I hated him for failing to stand up for himself. The resentment grew to loathing. And I found myself hitting him again. And again, and again. And this time when he failed to respond, I lashed out. And I left a handprint and a gash from my wedding ring on the side of his face. When I saw the blood, I was horrified that I was capable of doing physical harm to somebody that I once cared about. The father of my children. A man I'd spent most of my life with. I started to apologize but something in his eyes stopped me. He just looked so sad. He touched his face. And he studied the blood on his fingertips. 
He looked at me and said, there was a time when I would have given all of this for you. And then he walked out of the room and he closed the door behind him. called Ordinary Words. I thought about the words I just whispered to him and how much easier they were than the truth. Hallmark words, romance novel words, chick flick words, words I swore I'd never speak unless I meant them. That's the reason I desperately hoped he wouldn't repeat them back to me because I would doubt his sincerity. I would have preferred the way a mute person expressed themselves in the same situation. A look, a touch, a physical vocabulary expressed emotionally. Passion, I thought. My words so ordinary had lacked passion. Did he sense I wasn't speaking from my heart? That the insipid, wearisome words I uttered were my only means of bridging the ever-widening gap in my feelings for him? My name is Peg, and the title of this piece is Earth Mother. When my husband asked, why do you do it? I didn't have an easy answer. It's not like I'm one of those martyr types, the, the needy who need to be needed. He kept me busy enough cleaning up after him. And I know I'm getting on but I can still walk and drive, and so I'm an asset to my less mobile friends. I bring them food and necessities, remind them to take their medication, water their plants. I take care of their pets. I walk the dogs and clean up the litter boxes. Oh, I've cleaned plenty of poop, animal and human. Sometimes they remember to thank me. <coughs> Sometimes they don't remember who I am. Maybe because we're childless. Oh, we tried when we were younger, but not with the results I'd hoped for. I wanted to adopt, but he couldn't make up his mind and time passed and things never got resolved. Anyway, when he said, why do you let those old biddies take advantage of you? I hate that they don't appreciate what a kind and generous person you are. Well, I stood up in all my four feet, 10 inches, and I told him, it's your fault. You wouldn't let us adopt. You couldn't make up your mind. And now I'm just weary of mothering you. This piece is me too. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I wondered how much longer I could do it. Sleep with a woman I no longer loved, but still found sexually attractive. Damn, I couldn't even remember the last time we'd been intimate. It just seemed to turn into a stupid competition to see who could ignore the other, who was best at apathy. For the longest time, I simply masturbated in the shower. We were Catholic. And I guessed that self-abuse was a lesser sin than adultery. <laughs> but I became lonely when the kids started dating, out of the house, having their own lives. And there were too many soccer moms who were lonely too. According to gossip, gossip I was surprised to hear, I was a hot man. 
When the person you desired most finds you just short of disgusting, it's difficult to accept the fact that someone else might feel otherwise. That night, I stood by our bed for the longest, wondering if I should shower. I was nervous about what I had to do. I disrobed, naked, slid under the icy covers next to the warm body. Could I do what I had in mind? Maybe it wasn't in my nature, but just the thought gave me an erection. I leaned in and whispered, I'm sorry, dear. For what? She says, turning her back to me. I leaned in closer. You've left me no choice. I'm going to have an affair. She turned, looked at me, then spoke. A thin wisp of a smile on her lips. Me too, she whispered back. Hi, I'm Ray. This piece is the remains of her day. It's been years since I've been in a nail salon. Yesterday, I woke up late and staggered through the house wondering what to do with the remainder of my day. I, I lost myself somewhere. I, I don't know what to do with a day where I don't have someone to take care of. My hands are not used to idleness. They kept fumbling with the sash of the robe that I was living in. Oh, look at my hands. Dishwater rough, broken nails. I don't remember the last time I polished them, but it never lasted, what with the housework and the gardening, so I just gave up on it. I wonder when I gave up on myself. Like my hair, for lack of time, or so I told myself. I took the scissors and chopped it into this Joan of Arc hairstyle, hoping my husband and sons would notice. They didn't. They did notice when dinner was laid or their favorite pairs of jeans were not pressed. I noticed when the boys brought home that mangy stray dog. I knew I would be the one to take care of it. That dog proved to be such a consolation. It appreciated the love and the care that I gave it. And it broke my heart when he died. The men were way on a fishing trip. So I took the shovel and I dug a grave in my prized flower bed. I wrapped him in my best towel and buried him there in my roses, all the while thinking about my mortality. Uh, the boys are gone now, and my husband just, just died from prostate cancer. So, today, I'm doing something about my nails, something with the remainder of my day. This piece is called Messing Up. I don't know why she married me. I wasn't perfect, and she seemed to think she seemed to want me to be. Maybe she thought I was when we were married 18 years ago, but her assessment of me had changed through the years. Little by little, I disappointed her as she sought to perfect her surroundings. First, it was my weight. Then, it was the gray that crept into my hair. 
She purchased my clothes, laid them out each morning as my mother had when I was a child. The last few years, I moved into the guest room because, she claimed, I snored. I was sure I was just too pitiful for her to want to be romantic with. <sighs> I wish we had children now, someone to give my unrequited love to. So I settled on our cats. They were independent, as cats are, but at least they let me enjoy the pleasure of their company when she wouldn't. The house continued to change. Last year's items were replaced by the latest versions. I wondered if she secretly wanted to replace me with a new version. But the subject of divorce never came up. She seemed as resigned as I was to make the best of a bad situation. Was it possible to become compatible with incompatibility? To become tolerant of intolerance? Or was it my age and the amount of effort required to make me start a new life? Did I prefer this ever-changing, impersonal environment to living alone? Last night, I looked up to discover her staring down at me critically, her face screwed up in a repulsed look. My mind dashed back, wondering, had I farted? <laughs> no, not recently. I winced. My body stiffened, dreading the assault of words. Oh, for God's sakes, cut your damn toenails. They're disgustingly repulsive. And pick up your clippings. There's enough of you messing around the house. So, officer, that's why I had to kill her. <laughs> <laughs> This section of the program is called Alternative Lifestyles, and this piece is A Queer World. All right, let me get this straight. You want, you want me to tell you who I think I am? All right, fine. I look at myself in the mirror over the gay bar. Yeah, I'm gay, but I don't look gay. I look straight. I look straight in that virile Tom Selleck way. <laughs> if Tom Selleck is straight. <laughs> I am definitely not Will and Grace gay. Even though both actors are supposedly heterosexual married men, not. I am not one of them. I never dressed in my mother's clothes and I never wore my sister's makeup. That kind of thing repulses me. OK, look, just as there are distinguished lines in the straight world, there are divisions in the gay world, too. The low end being the faggots. I also, I also hated the word queer. In my day, that was a hate word. You could be killed if people even suspected you were queer. I used it once on my best friend. We just won the championship. I was a quarterback at the football team. We were, in the, we were in the locker room and he slapped me on the ass. Fuck you, you fucking queer. I yelled and I got everybody's attention. I embarrassed, I embarrassed my friend. It was funny, strange. After I said 
fuck you, I realized that's what I'd been thinking of for years. This piece is called Turn the Wheel. I want to thank you all for coming here today to, to honor our friend. These days are become so frequent and it's so hard on everyone. It makes you think, it makes me think of a day I was driving home from work and I had a really shitty day. I had all these negative thoughts rolling around in my head and I just had this uncontrollable urge just to steer into oncoming traffic. I mean, I had had similar urges before, thoughts of suicide, and it'd be easy, like turning a wheel. And in some ways, <laughs> In some ways, it would be a relief. Because, to be honest, I just wasn't keen on my life anymore. My life had become dull and uneventful. Ambition eluded me. Nothing surprised me anymore. My nights had become endless and my days intolerable. And I don't want anything anymore. I don't even want sex. <laughs> because when I was a younger man, sex motivated me. I would wake up every morning anticipating the day's new discovery of pleasure. But now, Sex was the enemy, and it was killing all of our friends. And their deaths have left me feeling abandoned and helpless. I don't want to die like my friends have been dying, being kept alive by a fistful of pills. I've sworn to myself that, that if that ever, <laughs> if that ever happens to me, I am just going to turn the wheel. This piece is called A Toxic Friend. Well, honey, I had let loneliness allow that asshole back into my life. Well, my options weren't any better, and I wondered why I attracted weak men. Or is it our strengths that diminish men in our eyes? Making them appear weaker than they are. I have tried sublimating my will to theirs. Well, I have sat through hours of Monday night football. I have eaten in restaurants where breasts are referred to as hooters. I dated a man who once referred to my Vagina as the playpen. <laughs> and, and their prelude to sex is, do you want to do it? Which had absolutely the opposite effect on me. Well, no wonder several of our friends have begun dating lesbians. Well, at least they know the lay of the land. Or to use a phrase from my latest disappointment, how the plumbing works. Why is sex so important? I have seen it all my life in magazine after magazine. Sex. Sex. I tried it way too early. Way too early to be disappointed. But no matter how many times I experienced male disappointment. I still could never imagine myself making love to another woman. Well, without an adequate fantasy life, self-gratification is just a chore without an end product. <laughs> so, 
we listen hopelessly to our sisters and girlfriends extol the virtues of a pleasure that has eluded us. An orgasm. The name of this piece is Magical Things. At a very early age, I became fascinated by all of the magical things that adorned my mother's dresser. The assortment of perfumes, powders, and cosmetics. There was nothing ordinary on that dresser. No tiny, cheap bottles of perfume. Instead, giant, fragrant, crystal bottles of Chanel No. 5 and Shalimar. Mostly dark with age. Men from ships brought these magnificent bottles. From exotic places with names like Caracas, or Aruba, or the Azores Islands. Did my mother appreciate these gifts or even know what they were? <laughs> Looking back, I doubt it. She would have been just as happy with a tiny little bottle of Blue Waltz from Woolworths because she was a lady with all the classy accoutrements and none of the class to pull it off. She would wear pearls with rhinestones. <laughs> Hell, even at age 10, I knew better. <laughs> <laughs> so I started picking her dresses for her, helping her dress for her evenings out on the town, or her evenings looking for a new daddy at places with names like the Gang Plank or the Dew Drop Inn. I picked her dresses. I buckled her bras and girdles. I strapped the buckles on her shoes. Before one of her big evenings out, we'd go for a drive. She would take me down to the Hula Hut or the Golden Arrow Drive-In for a burger and a malt in her slant-back Buick. It was the mid-40s sometime, and Ella's voice was singing the cow-cow boogie, soaring from those shiny black discs that my mother played on her phonograph. On special occasions, when she was meeting one of her merchant marine boyfriends, she would drag me down to the old Kentucky Inn and make me dance with her, embarrassing me. I wasn't proud of her. Didn't even much like her. That would come years later, after her death, when I realized the uniqueness of her. This is called Men with Women. I don't know. I've never told anyone this before. As long as I can remember, men with women stared at me. At first, when I was very young, I thought that they, the men with women, could see into my soul, tell I was different. It was the way I dressed, the way I walked, the way I talked. Whatever it was, I didn't want it. I didn't want to be so different that someone could read my thoughts. 
tell my sexual preference. Even though at that early age, I didn't know what the hell my sexual preferences were. All I knew was the looks that men with women gave me made me feel self-conscious and insecure. As a child, men with women touched me. Later, the boys with girls in the neighborhood experimented sexually with my young body. It was years before I realized that the men with women who stared at me on the streets while holding their girlfriends' hands, and the boys with girls who abused me in the alleys, in abandoned places, and then went on to marry and have children of their own, were just as confused and insecure as I was. The difference? I didn't fuck with their souls. This next section is entitled or headlined just because I want to. And this piece is called A Good Soul. I was stressed. The day had not gone the way I needed it to go. I put the truck in low gear and I started climbing that long hill toward home. And about halfway up, I noticed an elderly black woman laboring up the sidewalk. I surprised myself when I stopped the truck and I called to her. Hey, can I give you a ride? She turned, smiled, and struggled across the street into the truck. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This, this here hill is getting to be too much for an old lady like me. Said, well, I couldn't see you doing that when I have an empty seat right here. Well, I thank you mightily, sir. It's okay. Tell me where you want to go. I'll take you there. I live around here. She led me to what I'd always thought was an alley. Now, it was a private drive that led to this grand house overlooking the city. Beautiful views. I looked at her and asked, you work here? Yes, sir. As she opened the door, I stopped her. I said, hey, do you have any free time? I've got some friends, nice people, and they're looking for some help. She smiled. I said, no, sir, not this year. Maybe next year, I'll have a day off. She offered her hand, and I took it. It was strong, and it was calloused. And she smiled and said, God bless you, sir. And she closed the door and she walked to the house. And I sat there and I watched her, you know, like you'd watch a friend, make sure she's safe. After she was in the house, I turned to drive away. I wasn't stressed anymore. I was at peace. But it, it wasn't because I had done a good deed. Not because I've done a good deed, no. It's because I had been in the presence of a good soul. The N-word. 
since we've been discussing the civil rights movement, I uh, want to tell you what it was like for me growing up in the South in the 50s. I had always been awed and inspired by black people for as long as I can remember. But when I was a girl, there was no such thing as politically correct or incorrect. The N-word was bandied about casually, freely. This was due to ignorance, to insensitivity, to cruelty, and even to innocence. I remember skipping rope with my friends singing, any, many, miny, mo, catch a nigger by his toe. Oh, to this day, that nonsensical rhyme still haunts me. And then there was my child's delight in a certain candy. May I please have a nickel's worth of nigger babies? I ask as I eyed the glass jar filled with licorice in the shape of tiny black babies. When my dad failed to properly connect the washer and flooded the house, my mom yelled, why do you have to nigger rig everything? This was all so confusing to my little girl's mind. How was it that black people could have funny rhymes and delicious candies named after them and yet be blamed for the mess my dad had made? These mysteries were even more curious when the black people had their own town. And there was no part of town called White Town. And they had their very own water fountains and their own entrance to the movie theater where they got to sit up in the balcony. I had seen pictures of the Queen of England waving down from her balcony, so I knew that only the very best people got to go up on a balcony. Oh, I so wished I could go up there and wave to all the ordinary people below. I knew it was the very best place to be one day when I heard a little boy ask his mother, Mama, why do we have to sit up in the balcony when all the other people get to sit downstairs? Because the mother took her son by the hand and slowly led him up the steep, narrow steps. Because, baby, up there, We's closer to God. This piece is called An Aha Moment. It was the second lunch in a row that was spoiled by an ill-mannered child. At first, I was resigned. But when the child continued to cry and demand constant attention from his mother, who smiled weakly and avoided our exasperated stares, my resignation changed to restraint. I hated being angry at a time like this. While I was old enough to remember good manners and respect from one's neighbors, I was also know, wise enough to know that nothing remains constant and good manners are taught by example. I wasn't angry at the child, but the complacent mother who tolerated the boy's rudeness and gave in to his every whim. The mother pulled a plastic toy from her purse, trying to placate her hyperactive boy. He grabbed it from her with a sour face. Aha, I thought to myself, a future serial killer funny. As crazy as that thought was, I felt vindicated. <laughs> the lesser of the two hurts.
I didn't like my two children very much. They had grown into thoughtless and selfish adults with no children of their own. They loved their worldly possessions too much to, to share them with a child, much less with me. And it wasn't only the fact that they didn't take the time to return my calls or to inquire about my health as I got older. They didn't have the time. They were too busy working two jobs to, to pay for those worldly possessions. They had their own lives, I told myself. But there were times, lonely times, when I wondered whether the 18 months of agony was worth all the trouble. When, when a trip down a dark alley and a coat hanger would have saved me all the heartache. Oh, surely I never would have done that to myself or to them. But the ugliness of the act and the harshness of that reality sometimes seems the lesser of the two hurts. Finally, I get to go. I'm Todd. I'm doing Recycled Friends. I know my lines. This was the director's idea. Fuck them. Sure, I screwed up every relationship I ever had. I mean, I drove more people away than I ever kept. Not that I ever think it's my fault. I managed to justify most of the times. I'm the one being screwed over. I mourn the fact that I'm alone, that no one bothers with me. Well, they can kiss my ass. Although I don't know exactly who they are. I made this list of people I have cared for. And I began to check them off. Bitch. Asshole. Lunatic. Alienated family. Ex-lover. Ex-trick. Dead, dead, <laughs> dying. I stared at the list for a long time. It wasn't that I pissed off the whole world. My world was dying around me. And new friends aren't that easy to come by. Not at my age. Not in the youth-obsessed society I'm part of. I scanned the list again, wondering which friends could I recycle? This piece is called R-E-C-N-A-C. -E the word the word fell from his lips like a stone and lodged in the pit of my stomach. I looked over my shoulder, hoping to God he was speaking to someone else. There was no one else in the room. I looked back at the lips that had uttered the obscenity at me. Well, there were these lips that, well, I'd fantasized about kissing. They were attached to a handsome face. Or was it my need that made the face so appealing? Maybe I expected too much. And I wish now he hadn't given me hope. I pressed the rewind button in my brain and the obscenity sped backwards. R-E-C-N-A. 
A, C, cancer. I have cancer. <laughs> this piece is called Gone. I have been gone now for two years, traveling a great distance. I settled in a place that had absolutely no emotional connection for me, in a state I had never visited, in a town whose name I could barely pronounce. I would have gone farther had the money and the car not given out, but I was satisfied. I had run long enough for my anger to have given out also. The thing that amazes me is that I had absolutely no feeling of loneliness, just a, a sense of relief and a sort of contentment. Alone in the motel room, I studied my naked body in the crusty mirror that hung on the toilet door. It wasn't the body I remembered, not the one I liked. How could I compare that body to this one that now betrayed me? Boys and later men had loved and fondled this youthful body. Two husbands had appropriated it, demanded it, abused it. It had produced two beautiful and later spoiled children. And now it too failed me. I glanced down. I could look at it now, at the place where my breasts used to be, at the ugly scars that crisscrossed my chest. I took a deep breath. I was resigned. I was ready. When the friend who had cut Ken's hair for years moved to a new salon, one that catered to the elderly, Ken walked in the first day, looked around and said, wow, look at all these old people. Well, the friend quickly corrected him, said, we say mature. And that's the title of this next section of pieces. And I'm going to start it off by telling you about Bell. You know, mother was old, but she could still drive. And oh, it meant a great deal to her to drive Bell, her beloved 1980 Oldsmobile with the plush blue velvet seats. Oh, it was a gas guzzler, of course, but she only drove it as far as the market and Mr. Jean's hair salon. Mr. Jean had styled my mother's hair every Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock for 20 years. And I don't think she ever missed an appointment. Oh, when nor had her hairstyle changed in all those years. Mr. Jean lacquered it so it stayed from week to week. She could even sleep on it without mussing it at all. But her only concession in all those years was a ruse blonde minx to cover the gray because, oh, she hated gray hair. And she hated getting old. She couldn't relate to the old biddy sitting under the hair dryers at Mr. Jean. She, well, she wasn't wrinkled like they were. She took care of her skin. She cold creamed it every night. It was a ritual that drove my father to the spare bedroom, but she said it was worth it. <laughs> she, uh, well, she smoked when I was young, but luckily she'd stopped in time so that she didn't end up with that leathery skin like a lot of her friends. And, Oh, she was always secretly pleased when someone thought she was younger than those friends who still smoked. But then she did something stupid and 
And she fell and she hurt her hip and she had to use a walker. It was the same one my grandmother had used. She kept it in a closet in the spare bedroom because she hated the sight of the darn thing. The morning I drove her to the care facility that she was moving into, I watched her struggle into the kitchen with that walker and she stood there and looked out at the carport where Belle sat covered in a layer of gray dust. She said she wanted to get in it and just drive away. She had already outlived my father and most of her friends. She Just drive, she said as I walked her down to my car. She said she wanted to get in Bell and drive backwards through her life. Well, that's when I got the idea, and I turned and I walked her up to the carport as I was helping her into Bell. I asked her if she would do anything differently. She didn't answer the question, but she held tightly onto my hand, <coughs> and I knew the answer. A wish fulfilled. Oh, honey, for heaven's sake, don't you feel bad? She's been dying for years and years. Every little ache and pain was a death sentence. Her phone message said it all. Hello? Leave a message. <laughs> And if I'm still alive, I'll call you back. <laughs> she spent so much time dying, she didn't have time for the joys of living. I stopped dropping by because of her organ recitals, a never-ending list of her failing anatomy and gross bodily functions. Even her family cut visits back to the required holidays, and then only the hail of heart would show up. Oh, how they dreaded Mother's Day. She really needed attention, but she drove those of us who could give it to her away with her constant complaining. When she woke up on her 80th birthday to a dwindling list of people still willing to come see her, she turned to her grandson, the one she left everything to in her ever-changing will, and she said, if they don't respect me enough to visit me now, I don't want them at my funeral. And you know, when she died, she got her wish. <laughs> Recognition. I know I was wrong and I was ashamed not going over. Each day I made up new excuses for my selfishness, the kids being what I used the most. They had school, soccer games, dance classes, friends over. So I called, offering my list of excuses. I was relieved when they said they understood, but that didn't make my lies any more acceptable. When I hung up, a rush of rage always overcame me. Why did they have to be so damn understanding? Secretly, I wished they would be angry with me for once. They asked nothing from me, taking their old age with humility and candor. So why? Would I be that resilient? There weren't that many years between us. My mother was 
18 when I was born, 18 short years and life rushing by. My kids are teenagers now, and I'm looking in a mirror. Living in the past. It worried me that my friend spent so much time living in the past. At 70, she was energetic and healthy, and yet she cared not for the years ahead of her. Instead, she concentrated on the years behind her. She spent hours daily going over the old photo albums and scrapbooks. I invented ways to escape whenever the conversation turned to her past and she reached for her beloved books. I tried to get her to travel, to see the world, but the world had changed and it frightened her. One thing that always amazes me whenever we went on one of her sentimental journeys, gazing fondly at the yellowed photos, was how pretty she used to be. And yet she never thought of herself as pretty. She was never homecoming queen or class favorite or even popular. But now, when she looked at the old yearbook, she thought herself absolutely beautiful. Now why had she never thought that way before? I wondered. And why, whenever I paid her the slightest compliment, was she so embarrassed? She said she couldn't remember her mother ever telling her she was pretty. Her father, well, she couldn't remember him at all. He had vanished when she was three. Vanished was her mother's word. That bastard just up and vanished, never to be seen or heard from again. She showed me a single lone, fo a lone photo of her father, one that had survived her mother's disappointment. Taken by a street photographer, it, sh it put a face to the phantom. There he was, striding confidently past Woolworths Five and Dime, in a dark three-piece suit and a nice fedora, while a woman going in the opposite direction eyed him lustfully because he was a handsome man. Before her mother died, she summoned the courage to ask why she'd never been told she was pretty. Because, her mother gasped, because you looked like him, that bastard that just up and vanished. The meaning of art. Well, you know, dear, your mother always thought of herself as an artist. Well, it's all I ever wanted to be from the time I was a little child. And once you and your brothers and sisters left home and went off to college or got married, I decided I would fulfill that life's dream. I had the money after I divorced your father. I was independent, had no one making demands on me, no one telling me what to do. So I cleared out your old room and I set up an easel. I bought art supplies and enrolled in an art class. But at that very first class, I, I had trouble concentrating on the drawing. I, I just couldn't take my mind off the nude model's private parts. Dear, do you really think your mother could actually draw a man's penis? <laughs> well, so I, I, I repositioned myself in the classroom. I thought perhaps I could draw the young man's buttocks without having those lewd thoughts. But no. So I went to the market and I, I bought some fruit and, and I made a beautiful still life on the kitchen table. But the banana, <laughs> well, it reminded me, well, I removed that from the arrangement. But after a week or so, the fruit all rotted on the windowsill, and there was no art. So I lugged everything up to the old lake house. I thought perhaps a sunset would inspire me. 
and the sunset was beautiful. But it came and went, and there was no art. By now, I was embarrassed. I mean, for years, I'd been telling you and the family and all my closest friends that I was a suppressed artist that my soul yearned to create, but that the responsibilities of having a family kept me from producing anything. Now I felt like a fraud. Here I had all the time in the world, and the art just didn't come. And I felt very sad for a long time. But then, finally, I was able to invite my closest friends over. I opened a bottle of good wine, and I told them that it was time for me to exhibit my works of art. Oh, they were so happy for me. They were thrilled that I was finally going to realize my life's ambition. So I, I turned to the covered, framed piece on the easel. I said to my friends, you know, it took me a long time to understand the true meaning of art. And I took off the cover. Oh, at first my friends gasped, then they laughed, and then they applauded. Because there on the easel was a beautiful color portrait of my family. Okay, the piece I'm going to do is called Leaving. Sure, I could have left without saying a word, but where's the fun in that? I grabbed an armload of clothes from my closet and said, I'm leaving, dear, tossing them down on the bed beside him. Why do you ask? I said, I'm leaving. Oh, where to? His attention riveted on the ball game. Anywhere, I said, as long as it's away from you. Are you out of your mind? No, not yet, but I, I may, may very well be after another year of picking up after you. And I want a divorce. He sat up in bed. You can't get a divorce after being married 50 years. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's long enough waiting for someone to change. But I need you, he whimpered in that little boy voice he used for years to get his way. Yeah, I know you do, sweetie. I sat down on the bed beside him, took his hand in mine. I know you need me. You need me to cook and clean. You need me to wash your dirty clothes. You need me to have your coffee ready in the morning. You need me to run get a beer, regardless of how I feel. You, you need me to pay the bills. You need me to find the remote when you've misplaced it. Oh. And you needed me to bear your children, to feed them and nurse them when they were sick. You needed me to arrange their marriages and visit the grandchildren when you didn't even make an effort. And now you need me to make sure you take all your medication. So why am I leaving? I'm leaving, dear, before you need me to wipe your ass. <laughs> The name of this piece is Do Dogs Cry? Hell no, I hated the damn dog. And here I was out walking in on the end of a pink leash with rhinestones, begging it to poop. And I was embarrassed. I knew I looked foolish out walking a ratty old toy white poodle named Fluffy. It was my wife's dog, and I had no use for the animal while she was alive. But I promised her on her deathbed that I would take care of the mutt, who only tolerated me, who bit me on numerous occasions, and who peed in my shoes more than once. Everything in the house reminded me of her. Especially the goddamn dog. And it was months before I could forgive it for that. 
Like me, Fluffy mourned my wife's passing. It lay by the door for a week, waiting for its mistress to return and refusing to eat, and it worried me. I sat in my damn recliner and watched the blurry images on the TV. I'd mislaid my glasses. When my wife was alive, she knew where I left everything. Nothing on the TV appealed to me. Not even the shows we watched religiously. It was just too damn painful. And I missed her something awful. I glanced over at her chair where Fluffy was curled up asleep. The dog looked at me and it startled me because I found myself wanting to like the animal. I am just lonely, I thought. Maybe the animal shelter could find someone to give the dog the love it needs, the love my wife lavished on it, the love I was jealous of, and give it a good home for the few remaining years of its life. I felt a flush of guilt as the man carted the dog off to the waiting van. A sudden struggle, and the dog leapt out of his arms and ran back to me. I was confused by the unexpected behavior. I scooped up the trembling dog and with a heavy heart returned it to the man turned and started back to the house. I didn't want to see the van drive away. I strode back through the early morning mist that covered the lawn, a lawn that was turning brown with neglect. Stumbled into the house. It was quiet. Too damn quiet. I poured myself a cup of day old coffee, sat down at the table, and my eyes fixed on the green kitchen foam that hung by the refrigerator. No. No. I'll wait. Give them time to get there. Austin Theater community lost um, a very wonderful, vibrant personality last week, very suddenly. Um, and we have dedicated our shows today to Scotty Wilkerson, who passed away a week ago today. And we miss her, and Ken misses her. They were good friends. Every, anybody who knew Scotty or worked with her appreciated what a wonderful, vibrant, and happy person she was. So tonight, I'd like to read this poem that Ken wrote for, on, upon her passing for Scotty. She was here yesterday, making plans for the future, making sure he was comfortable, but she's gone today. She was here yesterday, in the kitchen baking bread, dreading the trip to the hospital, but she's gone today. She was here yesterday, talking of the past, remembering the place she was in, but she's gone today. What happened? that she would suddenly disappear like that, without a trace of her in the house. She was here yesterday, hugging friends and laughing about some old remembrances. But she's gone today. And she'll be gone tomorrow, too. Because an angel came, unexpectedly, 
sweeping her up and flew away with her to heaven. How else can you explain that she was here yesterday? Our friend Scotty. Thank you.